nobody. Uh, so thank you, thank you for the invitation. And uh, this is a, a key question, probably one of the most important in the ICU, uh, the, the, the decision to intubate and ventilate. And the, the answer is uh, we don't know. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so this will be another talk without uh, RCT. So these are my conflicts of interest. We, we receive uh, equipment and, uh, um, and research grants from uh, different companies. This is the same. So I'm going to start with two extremes where intubation is helpful or harmful. So the first situation where intubation is helpful is to help the circulation. Um, and I'm, I, I like this uh, slide because it's, uh, so it's experimental study, uh, but I can see this situation relatively often in the ICU of patients uh, being under spontaneous breathing with some degree of uh, cardiovascular dysfunction and where the blood lactate is going up. Um, so, okay, I have the laser. What do I do next? Okay, anyway, the, the lactate is going up um, because of the oxygen consumed by the respiratory muscle. And remember, we use like 5% of the total cardiac output in, uh, uh, for the oxygen consumption of the respiratory muscle. But when patients go into respiratory distress, values as high as 25, 30, 35% of the um, oxygen is consumed by the respiratory muscle, which means the blood flow is redistributed to the respiratory muscle because of this activity. And therefore, you have much more circulatory dysfunction in the rest of the body, and that's why the lactate are going up. And very often you will see a patient with rising lactate during spontaneous breathing. You intubate the patient and lactate are normalized. So instead of giving fluid, 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 mechanical ventilation may be the solution. And of course, you, um, you know these classical studies which suggested that uh, the diaphragm may fatigue. And again, this is an experimental study. It's, it's an important one because so you see the PDI, the first tracing, the EDI, the electrical activity, and the phrenic nerve activity is the third tracing. And you see in this animal uh, the electrical activity of the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm is going up, but the pressure generated by the diaphragm is going down. So this was the demonstration of fatigue. Interestingly, the only situation, experimental situation, where it has been demonstrated are during shock, either cardiogenic shock or septic shock. So if you let an animal in shock, <coughs> Breathing spontaneously, the animal will die of diaphragmatic fatigue. I'm not sure you knew that, so that's good. You learned something. Um, but the limit is that it's very rare to see real fatigue in our patients for two reasons. Why is that? Is that we tend to ventilate or connect to the ventilator a patient who at risk of developing fatigue? And also because uh, you need probably the combination of a high work of breathing and a low um, uh, input from the circulation because the patient is in shock. So remember, intubating a patient for sh non-controlled shock is something really very useful. I, I like to show this slide for different reasons. This is a classical study of uh, weaning-induced pulmonary edema by Francois Lemaire, where patients were disconnected from the ventilator. Uh, the first tracing on, on the top is the wedge pressure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. 
reflecting the left atrial pressure. And the second tracing is the esophageal pressure, and you see these impressive negative pressure swings. So many things at the same time, huge uh, venous return, high afterload on the left ventricle. Um, and I, I show this here because you see at the end, end we, which is only nine minutes, the esophageal pressure swings are going down, which is probably the, the only uh, demonstration of fatigue in man. I don't know if it's central fatigue, which means the brain wants to stop breathing, or peripheral fatigue, which is the muscle, but um, I think everybody would agree seeing this patient that this patient needs to be reconnected to the ventilator as soon as possible. So this is one extreme where, you know, intubation is definitely life-saving. But there is another extreme where intubation may be performed for questionable reasons and which lead to poor outcomes. And we have an example with the COVID pandemic. So this is the... I, I'm, not going to blame anyone. I'm just saying this is the very early phase of the pandemic. I, I'm sure you remember, right? Quite stressful for everybody and a lot of patients coming at the same time. And a virus which we were told were, is, were, was going to spread very quickly and was a deadly virus. So a lot of patients have been intubated. And the uh, group of Cathy Rowan has a registry where every patient in the ICU uh, in, uh, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, so no, no Scotland here, um, mm -hmm. is monitored uh, very carefully. And so they could look at uh, what happened during the first wave of COVID. So the graph on the top uh, right is showing the, the number of patients, the percentage of patients which receive invasive ventilation. And you see there is a peak um, around April, and, and so they compare the, um, initially the, the percentage was very high, 70%, because patients were hypoxemic, and because there was, you know, uh, some, some fear about the the, the, the virus contaminati contaminating everybody. So that's what I would say is not a very good reason in terms of patient care, but this is how it was done. And then days after days, and you see after the peak of uh, the COVID, this first wave, uh, there was less and less patient intubated. And the other graph just show the severity of patients. And the severity is the same. Okay, at the beginning, when a lot were intubated, or later on, same severity. So let's say they are comparable. And then they look at the mortality and they try to adjust as the, as the, the best possible, the 28-day mortality. And you see on the right, you see the mortality before the peak, at the time of the peak, and after the peak, when much less patients were intubated. And it's very clear, there, there was an excess in mortality related to an excess of intubation for the reason uh, uh, we can understand. So, so there is a risk of intubating too much. And that's where I could stop my presentation because the rest is the kind of gray zone. So in this gray zone, we have the risk of letting a patient breathing uh, spontaneously too long and too hard, and we have called that uh, uh, self patient self-inflicted lung injury, which is a term which has shocked some people because it's not the patient inflicting himself, but it's the brain of the people which is uh, of the patient which is dr driven by a very uh, severe injury, which has as a consequence, uh, a, um, a worsening of the lung injury. And for instance, we have this data suggesting that when the tidal volume of the patient under non-invasive ventilation become too high, and in this, uh, in this retrospective study by Guillaume Carto, it was above nine milliliters per kilogram, 
the risk of failure at non-invasive ventilation is very high, and we know patients who fail non-invasive ventilation are, are then intubated uh, very frequently do poorly. And it's interesting because in, in a completely independent cohort, the subgroup of the Florali study who, who receiving non-invasive ventilation, the same data were observed. Tidal volume ho higher than nine, uh, uh, high risk of failure and poor outcome. So, so we think that this risk of ventilator uh, self-inflicted lung injury does exist. Um, there is a very recent study published in the Blue Journal, which is an experimental study, again showing uh, self-inflicted lung injury and trying to describe the characteristic of this, uh, of this situation. It's, it's a very smart study. It's an animal, it's rats. They developed lung injury, and in one group, they intubated the patients uh, to deliver protective mechanical ventilation. And in the other group with the same lung injury, they let the patient, the animal, sorry, breathing spontaneously and they developing self-inflicted lung injury. And there was a third group intubated but receiving injurious mechanical ventilation. And they showed that both with injurious mechanical ventilation or spontaneous breathing, you develop lung injury. What was interesting is that the type of lung injury is not exactly the same. The location is more basal in the spontaneous ventilation, which makes sense. And also, I show this picture because they, they show much more, um, sorry, vascular pattern. This is the, um, the, the photograph on the right, uh, more vascular effect of spontaneous ventilation, which again makes sense. You make the pressure in the chest more negative. So if we could, I think that uh, the best technique to decide when to intubate a patient in this regard, the risk of uh, self-inflicted lung injury, would be to have esophageal pressure. To me, there is no question. That's, that's the best. That's what we would like to know. Is the work of breathing of this patient measured by the reference technique, with the, uh, uh, which is esophageal pressure? Is, is it uh, decreasing with the high flow, CPAP, BiPAP. And this is a very nice example. On the right, you have the esophageal pressure swings, and it, it's, it's absolutely perfect. You completely identify the patients with no effect of, of the NIV in this that case, and the patients who uh, do have a decrease. So uh, this is the negative value, right? So the lower the value, the less uh, negative uh, the, the swing. But the key point is to look at the second part of the slide, the second graph, which is now displaying the distending pressure of the lung. And remember, the distending pressure of the lung will be the pressure delivered by your ventilator plus the amplitude of the negative pressure swing. And in the patients who do not improve their work of breathing, the only effect observed is an increase in the distending pressure because you add to the spontaneous breathing the assistance given by the ventilator. So again, that would be fantastic to have that in every patient. I, I, I do think for the moment it's, it's really reserved to specific research protocol. Uh, and, and maybe that's something we should try to work in the future. So. If we, if we don't know, can we define criteria to say this is when we should intubate? Well, we asked these patients a number of, uh, this question a number of years ago when we designed a study for non-invasive ventilation for COPD. And we say, well, there is nothing in the literature. We have to decide when we intubate. And I'm not going to read everything, but we say, okay, there are some major criteria, like uh, respiratory arrest, so on which we can agree that we should intubate patients. Uh, major in, uh, uh, hemodynamic instability, a bradycardia below 50. But then there are minor criteria, and you need at least two minor criteria and after one hour to say, yes, we should intubate. 
Just to reflect the, the difficulty we had to define very clearly how and when to intubate the patient. But at the end, this was the clinician's decision. So this was 1995. Um, a number of years later, in the Florali study, same problem again, different population, but again, how do we define when a patient should be intubated? And again, you will find the um, major criteria and the minor criteria saying we need to have uh, at least two, like having a high respiratory rate, but also high respiratory muscle workload, which is very subjective uh, feeling. Um, and at the end, it remains something which is the, the decision of the clinician. So recently, a um, colleague from um, Toronto, Chris Yarnell, uh, who, who became uh, an expert in, in statistical model, etc., uh, say, okay, if we look at the threshold for invasive ventilation, those who had been defined in our study, in the Florali study, in, in all the trials which said when to intubate the patient, are they applied in clinical practice? And so there's a long list I'm not going to look at, and the first one are purely oxygenation criteria, <coughs> The next are the ROX index, uh, which uh, described by Oriol, uh, and also some of the combination. Uh, just to say, when it happens in a database of uh, very granular data, are patients intubated? And he, he looked at whether patients were intubated within the next three hours. So in the First column, you have the number of patients who met the threshold. So uh, there, there is a large variety. And in the next column is the percentage of patients who are not intubated. Clearly, and this was the, what is called the MIMIC database. It's data from Boston. It's one center, which is limited, right? You could say this is this center. So he used another database, which is from Amsterdam. So different country, different uh, uh, practice, but the results were almost the same. So, and he said, okay, but this is the first three hours. So maybe the patients are intubated later. And this is uh, what is shown by this color. The blue is the first three hours. And then you have the, first, the next eight hours or the next 24 hours and even 48 hours. So you see that, and again, this is the two cohorts, you, you never reach even 120 hours, 50% of intubation. So there is a big difference between what we say and what we do <laughs> for probably uh, um, uh, good reasons. Okay, let's just finish, and this is uh, uh, the last thing I'd like to do. So now if we look at the question differently, if we say, if we look at database and look at patients who have been intubated early versus patients who have been intubated late, and again, no randomized trial, uh, is there a difference? So this is a study done by Ricard Melado Artigas. Um, he took a, a French database of uh, septic shock patients and to make a long story short, he could not find a difference between patients who were intubated early and intubated late, trying to match the best possible way um, the, the, the patients. So suggesting, but that's just a suggestion that in general, a wait and see strategy toward intubation um, uh, could decrease the use of intubation without <coughs> incurring an excess of mortality as probably we have seen very, very frequently during the COVID period. Maybe we should try to have more precise index. I'm just showing the ROCA index. No, sorry, the ROCS, ROCS index. <laughs> um, because uh, when he did another study, which is under review now, he found that if you take the patients with the ROCS index uh, below 488, as, as previously published, you may see a benefit of uh, of intubation, but uh, again, it needs uh, a lot of refinement. So when to intubate? Well, first, 
um, try to remember why we intubate. Uh, we probably need combination of indexes. The most important is the work of breathing, which we do not measure, and respiratory rate is a very poor surrogate of that. Um, and the COVID experience plus the data uh, we have suggests that with the different non-invasive ventilation technique we have, uh, it's probably a good idea uh, often to, to wait to intubate better than too early. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we can just take one quick comment, if you want, just one quick comment. Uh, please proceed to the gold room for the opening ceremony. Just one quick comment and one quick question. Uh, I, I really love the seminal papers that you present at the beginning. At that time, high flow was not present. And Tommaso Mauri published a paper in septic patients who were not hypoxemic. I, by using high flow, he could decrease the respiratory drive. So he could decrease the risk of patient self-inflected lab injury. Would you consider to use it in this scenario in order to even avoid intubation, at least in some group of the the patients? Yeah, to, to just uh, answer quickly, most of the patients not intubated or intubated late were on high flow, which, uh, yeah, so that, that I, I agree, yeah. Right. Thank you. So since we can't measure uh, work of breathing easily at the bedside, do you think it's still very much a clinical call until we have more defined, well-defined criteria? Yeah, uh, I hope, hope we'll find some techniques to, right. to better measure the work of breathing. Yeah. There is uh, the group of Tonelli. They put a small catheter in the nasopharynx and uh, occlude the nose to have a, a reflection of the esophageal pressure swings. Yeah. I don't know. We need to test that. That's, uh, that, that's something uh, which could help us to decide. And just uh, one more thought. You know, a lot of papers talk about early versus late. Do you think this is a fair comparison? Because it's actually the clinical condition of the patient. What is early for one patient may actually be late for the other. So do you think you should just go by the, uh, the clinical state of the patient rather than talk about early intubation and late intubation? So, Especially in COVID, we saw this. I think the analogy with all the studies which have been done for renal replacement therapy works well. You remember renal replacement therapy is, uh, okay, should we initiate uh, the technique early or can we wait until the creatinine is higher, uh, etc.? And the benefit of waiting is that there are many patients which we will improve. Yeah. So at the end of the day, at least uh, if the outcome is not different, you spare a lot of intubation or renal replacement therapy. Right. Thank you very much. Please give him a big round of applause.